All right, we appreciate Justin. He's going to be a pastor today, right? So <laughs> maybe the vote's still in. We haven't, I haven't read the ordination council's votes yet, so we'll, we'll go over that in a minute. All right, today, for those of you who are visiting, is a special day in, in the life of our church. Those of you who are here all the time, uh, this is a, a, a special day that we set apart to, to ordain one of our own into the ministry. Uh, we're setting aside this day. This, th- these days don't come along often. You know, it's not like um, when we do the Lord's Supper or baby dedications or funerals or weddings. This is something... This is a one in a 10 year experience here. This is the first one that has went through the observation and has um, met the requirements that we believe to be ordained into the ministry. So today we set aside for Justin, our worship leader, to become the worship pastor, if the votes come in, in a little while. So uh, I just want you guys to know that this goes all the way back to the Old Testament. Uh, Ordination took place for Aaron. And his sons as priests is described in Exodus chapter 28, Exodus chapter 29, and over in Leviticus. That's the first real ordination that we can find in Scripture. And then the first century, as the church was born, which we are in the church era, a, an ordination started taking place, setting people apart to be pastors, overseers, elders, however you want to articulate it. This morning... We will be elevating Justin to the office of pastor, elder, what they focus on, praise and worship, maybe. Your daddy told me to tell you just maybe a whole bunch of times. So I just do it because he slipped some money in my pocket, and you know I go to the highest bidder. So <laughs> this morning is a, is, a, is a special time, it's a joyful time, but We'll get serious here in just a second. So what is the job of a pastor? What is the job of an elder? Not what you think it is, not what your preconceived idea of what a pastor, what an elder's job consists of. What does Scripture say? The elder's task is to be one of oversight and one of obedience. It's a job of being the under-shepherd for the great shepherd, Jesus Christ. In Paul's farewell letter to the church of Ephesus, this is what he says. I'm quoting, keep watch over yourself and all the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you an overseer. The Holy Spirit is what calls you to the ministry and the Holy Spirit is what will sustain you through your ministry. But you notice what Paul said to the church of Ephesus. Keep watch over yourself first and then the flock. Over in Acts 20, verse 28, it says, Be shepherds of the church of God, which he brought with his own blood. He bought with his own blood. This is telling you the seriousness of what you're stepping into. It was purchased with the blood of Christ. Justin joins our team of overseers here at Paris Mountain Church. He will ensure to help our leadership team to make sure that we're meeting your spiritual needs, meeting your personal needs. He will help in an under-shepherd role to, to mentor you, to help bring you along on your spiritual path. He also will help us spread the good news of Jesus in a dark, chaotic world. This is what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow, excuse me, as a fellow elder, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving and overseeing. What I'm trying to tell you is this, and I believe Peter is trying to stress this. You first must be a servant before you can be a servant leader. Not because you must, but because you're willing. Your heart must always remain willing. Can't be greedy for money, like Jimmy. I don't know how he slipped through the cracks. But you've got to be eager to serve. Can't lord over those who are entrusted to you. Peter goes on to say, you've got to be an example. And unfortunately, that means Alex as well. Which is your better half, trust me. 
And it goes on to say, and when the chief shepherd appears, read that out loud to me. At the Bema seat. If you do your job correctly, that crown awaits you. But you know what? As we studied the Bema seat several months ago, that crown can also be taken away from you. There's no guarantee. Moving forward, as I said, Justin is going to help us here at Paris Mountain Church with a focus on under shepherding the praise and worship team, developing a better praise and worship product, so to speak, a a better way of doing things. He will help with funerals and weddings and all that sort of stuff. In fact, you know, if you want him to do your wedding or if you prefer him to do your funeral, you know, I don't get offended if you say, hey, I'd rather have Justin or somebody else do it. We're all on Team Jesus, right? All right, so Scripture provides us with the qualifications of a pastor and elder. And I want to read those to you guys because this is what you must consider before you set somebody apart to this office. There's two offices in the church, that of elder and deacon. The elder serves as the overseer, as the pastor. Uh, different, different functions within the elder. Uh, model here, Justin is stepping into the teaching pastor role of the elder model. The qualifications for a bishop, elder, pastor as listed in Scripture can be found in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Here is a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach. Justin qualifies for that. Faithful to his wife. Alex is saying he better qualify for that. Temperate. Self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect if anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. Paris Mountain, listen to me. I can assure you that Justin meets these spiritual requirements that are mandated by the Apostle Paul to that young preacher, Timothy. I have seen it firsthand over a decade now. So how do we get here to this moment? Justin has served faithfully. Justin is a man of integrity. Justin is a man who is faithful. Justin is a man who is dependable. Justin is loyal. Thank you for speaking into his life and help mold him to that. He has served in different capacities. He is now our worship leader here at Paris Mountain Church. I have seen this guy grow from a kid to an adult. I have, I have most importantly, you can say I have, I have observed him to grow in grace knowledge of the Lord, how to go from being a young kid, kind of selfish dating, to being a daddy, to being a husband. I've seen your eagerness develop to want to share the gospel with others. I've seen your passion for the talent and gifts that God has given you when it comes to praise and worship. I've seen you work hard to develop those. I've seen you work harder to develop those gifts in others. But I guess I really like to see your passion to see souls saved and to see people's lives changed and do it in a non-judgmental way. 
loving people for where they are, who they are, and not judging them for how they got there, but giving them a lifeline to get out. After careful consideration and prayer, I approached Justin and asked him to pray about entering the ministry. He wasn't quick to jump on that. But he did pray about it. He prayed about it. He carefully considered it. I'm sure he sought wise counsel from other people. Because that's the way he operates. And then he came to me and said he feels it's time to take the next step. So here we are. Justin was tested during the ordination council of pastors yesterday. And it was a split decision. So we convinced, I had to convince the two no votes. Just kidding. That brings us to here. Before we lay hands and pray for Justin, before we officially set him apart as a pastor and elder, I'm going to quickly ask him some questions. And then I'm going to ask you as a church community a question. Justin, as I ask you these questions, you can answer in the affirmative, yes, I do. Um, I know you, so I worked it out to where if you say no or answer in the negative, we have an issue. Okay? So just nod your head yes when I'm done if you're nervous. All right? And we, we know your heart. Justin, will you lead a life worthy of emulation. By that I mean Hebrews chapter 13, 7 tells us that we need to live our life in a way that speaks to others and they say, hey, I want that. Will you joyfully, will you intently care for the souls of this flock here at Paris Mountain Church? Because one day you're going to give an account for each of them. Do you understand that there is a stricter judgment that exists according to James chapter 3, verse 1 for teachers, elders, and pastors? Are you going to dedicate yourself to prayer? Are you going to dedicate yourself to your family? Are you going to dedicate yourself here to church, to Paris Mountain Church, and in that order, God, family, church? Will you be a man of prayer? Are you willing to shepherd God's flock that has been allotted to you here? Are you going to model what a servant leader looks like? Are you going to carefully weigh the words that you use, that you use to teach with, that you use to counsel people with, because there's power of life and death in words? Will you choose them carefully, not just here, but out there? Justin, are you going to value the Word of God over a theological debate one? Are you going to protect, protect the doctrine of the faith? We mentioned it, the Apostles' Creed, the hill to die on. Are you going to live a life that's not ashamed of the gospel and Jesus, not just here but everywhere you are, no matter what audience you're in front of? Do you understand, Justin, that seasons of life change, but the call in your life will not? Justin, in the sight of God and these witnesses, do you promise to do your best? Paris Mountain Church, I have a question for you. Will you follow the leadership of your newly appointed pastor? If so, please stand. Justin, turn around and look. You can be seated. It's time to walk the gauntlet, son. Now, in the military, we did a whole lot. We did worse, didn't we? I'll give you a little pop at the end. This time I'd ask all the ordained pastors and the people who uh, were part of the ordination council to step forward. Make a line right here. Make a line right here. Face him. 
And then I'm going to send you guys up to quietly pray, talk to them, whisper words of encouragement to them. What in a time? And I'll follow in. Ask the elders of our church, serving elders, to step forward. I guess I was going to share my testimony a little bit. So you guys know me, but you don't know, know me. So I grew up in the church. My mama was a worship leader at a Cornerstone Church. I loved going to church more than school. I had more friends at church than school, it felt like, you know. But um, just loved running around. was always around worship music and stuff. But um, I did have a phase. I think we all have a phase. I call it a punk kid phase, usually about middle school, high school. And uh, just thought I, was, I had the world figured out. I was the smartest thing in the world, you know, and all this stuff. And um, there was really a moment right after high school, my senior year, uh, this, this question came to my head. I'm, what am I going to do next? I'm done with school. Um, am I going to go work for my dad? Am I going to go do my own thing? Am I going to go to college? And I really just felt lost. I was like, man, this, this felt like a pivotal moment for me. And there was a, a worship service we were doing for a summer camp. And uh, there was a guy I really respected. He, he boldly spoke that night. I couldn't even tell you what he spoke about. I don't even remember. But just that action of him speaking inspired me. And, and uh, we got off in groups on our own and, and prayed by ourselves. And I remember just praying to God. God, just show me the way. Like, make it, make it obvious. Give me a neon sign that a, that a donkey could understand. Show me what to do, because I, I don't know. I'm lost. And I, I didn't get an answer, you know. So I was just like, oh, whatever, kind of bummed. But um, obviously, looking back now, I, I did get an answer. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, I wanted to share this verse with you guys, and I want you to, to leave knowing this, too. I wish I would have read this verse that night. <clears throat> this is Micah 6, 6 through 8. And the question is, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow, and bow down before the exalted God? What do we bring God? What do we give the God that has everything? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with a thousand rams, with ten thousand rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? This is the answer here to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. And if you go back, one cool thing to notice is the, uh, the first bit says, should I give him a calf a year old? You know, that's Old Testament sacrifice. That's probably feasible, right? You know, a calf a year old. Then it says a thousand rams. I don't know if anyone had a thousand rams back then. Maybe the richest of the richest people, but you can see a process of it getting more and more drastic. With 10,000 rivers of olive oil, now we're getting into the level of fantasy. Like, you know, that doesn't even exist. And then the most precious thing, shall I offer my firstborn son or, or daughter? But, uh, and then if you go back to verse 8, the end there, God doesn't want any of that. And, that, and this, is, this is how I feel too as well, but he just wants your heart. That's all it is. He don't want rivers of olive oil. He doesn't want all the gold and silver in the world. He wants these three things. Act justly. Live a moral life. Love justice. Love mercy. Be merciful to others. But I think, to me, love the mercy that was given to us. That we're, we deserve punishment for, for our sins, for my punk life, my punk kid life that I, I, I grew up in. But to love mercy, love the sacrifice that Jesus gave. He gave me a second chance, a new life. And to walk humbly with your God. And I didn't know that, but I'd been doing that. And, and this is how it got to me. It got to this point here now, but especially walk humbly with your God. I remember that night when I prayed, I just said, same thing as Isaiah, just God send me. I'm tired. I don't want to live just a life where I just wake up, go to work, eat, go to sleep, repeat, and then die. I want to do something positive in the world. I want to leave a mark. I want to leave the world a better place than I, than I had it, I guess. But I encourage you guys to, to follow that as well. You don't know where to lead you. You might be up here in my shoes one day. I don't know, but, but it doesn't matter what walk of life you're in, maybe. Maybe you're in an in-between season of, of work. Maybe you're, you feel like you're old and useless or whatever, but do those three things. That's all God wants. It doesn't matter what job you have. There's no one job that's more pleasing to God than another job. It doesn't matter uh, what, if you're just a mom, if you're even just a mom. Just do those three things. To love justice, or no, act justly, love mercy, and to uh, walk humbly with God. But Man, thank you guys so, so much. And that's going to be my life first, I guess. Or it has kind of been my life first. But, um, yeah, so that's kind of my testimony is just I didn't ask for this. I just, I don't know. 
it's crazy to see where, uh, where God brings you out of this. And I think back about that prayer all the time. I'm just like, man, I said God used me, and, and here I am today. So, but I think maybe Mama wanted to share something too. Family, you want to come up with them? Is it okay if I'm a proud mama this morning? <laughs> I'm so proud of you. I'm proud of the son you are. Like Pastor Jai was saying, I'm so proud of the decisions that you've made. I'm proud of the choices of your daughter-in-law. I'm proud of these babies. But most importantly, I'm so proud of the man of God that's standing here right now. And I love the verse out of 3 John uh, chapter 1, verse 4, where it says, I have no greater joy than to see my child walk in God's truth and I'm so proud of you this morning seeing that to piggyback a little bit and I won't share all the funny stories I know Justin was like mom don't give her a mic but at the age of seven Justin he was so sensitive to God at the age of seven even and inquisitive he was in Awanas he would learn all these Bible verses and get these badges and so so proud of himself and one night, I know Daddy Ron and, and I took him to a special service. There were like seven, 800 people attending this service. And um, Justin, different than normal, sitting in the service, he was listening to every word that the preacher was preaching. And by the time the invitation came, Justin was pulling on my arm, and he said, Mama, I want to get saved. I want to get saved now. We were sitting at the top of the balcony, and we walked all the way down the balcony in front of seven, 800 people, and Justin walked like a boss to the front and told them he wanted to get saved, and he did it without any hesitation. Well, that night in the car riding home, I said, Justin, you know, just discussing, making sure he understood what he had done. He said, Mom, I asked Jesus into my heart to stay like the song goes, and you need to call the preacher because I want to get baptized on Sunday morning. <laughs> so I think he got it. But... One other story I wanted to share, and the Spirit of God just kind of urged me to be sure and say this. When Justin was talking about his punk years, -wee. <laughs> it wasn't long, but he did have this, this little time during the years, um, well, it was 2009 to 10, right, when you were graduating um, in that, that period. And Justin just had an inward struggle. And... I didn't know what else to do. You know, when your kid kind of closes down and you don't want to push them, I took it to God. And my prayer specifically was, God, be a guiding light to him. Be a bright, bright light. Let him feel his presence so much that it's absolutely life-changing. And to walk with Justin. Um, Justin had, had kept saying, Mom, how do you hear God's voice? He kept asking him questions like that. And so, so I said, God, let him hear your voice. Amplify it to him. So the night that Justin's talking about, he left out the part, probably for time, but he left out the part, one of the youth leaders, Jason, that had walked close to him during this time, during that worship set, he said they were in a deep worship, and he said Justin's music was different than it had ever been. He said it was just crazy. He said it was beautiful, but it was just, he said he looked up. He said because it was that different, he wanted to look up and observe Justin. He said when he did, he said, I couldn't even hardly see Justin's form. He said there was this bright, bright light. He said it was almost like he was looking up like, okay, did Exodus put some new stage lights or something in here? He said, but there weren't any new lights. He said Justin was totally engulfed with this bright, bright light. And he said as Justin was walking around the stage, the light just followed him. He said it was almost like he and the light were one. And he said it was like that light was walking with him. And I just wanted to balk because God was so specific, not only to my prayer, but to his prayer at the time when he was asking just to have a life-changing moment in a, I don't know, just a presence of God moment where it totally changed his life. And if I can fast forward to 2021, and this is the last I'm going to say, but Justin and I have always had a passion loving to discuss biblical stuff and God moments and in the Bible and prophecies and all that that fun deep stuff but one night we were talking and Justin was talking about here Paris Mountain Church and he said mom he said I'm so excited he said I'm just so excited about what God's doing here at the church he said what he's doing on my team through Pastor Jai through all the people here he said it's like God's taking this church to a new level and he said I'm so excited mom and just the passion in his voice he went on for a, a long time like he and I can do but he was so excited, and 
And I said, Justin, God's not only changing and taking this level to, you know, this church to a new level. I said, I feel like God's really preparing you for something, like maybe another calling, like a higher level. I said, I don't know. I said, but son, get ready. That's all I said, get ready. And he just kind of smiled like he does. But I really feel like those moments kind of let him up like he was saying to hear. And I couldn't be more proud of you, Justin. And I just, I love you so much. Thank you. One thing I forgot to say in the testimony, y'all would not know it now, but I used to be a complete stick on stage. And I just played guitar, I didn't sing. I would not move, but after that summer camp moment, something really did, the Holy Spirit lit a fire in me. And I just, I thought if I'm gonna play music for the creator God of everything, I, I gotta do it 120%, you know. Just, I can't look like a stick on stage anymore. I gotta actually practice these songs. I gotta actually hone my craft, so. I'm not, I'm not used to talking, so I left that out of my testimony. But. Anybody else? All right. Nobody else? Speak now. Ever hold your peace? Oh, boy. I happen to be the dad. So <clears throat> Justin's worked for me for since he was probably 14 or 15 years old. Sandy bring him to the shop in the summertime and all that. How he manages the people that I hire is beyond me because we have a crew. They show up half the time, part of the time, work some of the time. But how he does it and actually gets them to do stuff is beyond me because I would lose it. So I just go up to my office and I come back and everybody's working. And it's like, Justin. So part of, one of the attributes of the 12 attributes of being a, a preacher or a pastor was the long suffering and getting people to do stuff. That's what he does. His mom and Ron really molded him when he was younger. Well, now, how long have you worked for me? Like full time? Like a long time? Yeah. So he went from, you know, knocking duck together to doing whatever he was told to actually running the shop. And that's what he does now. And all I get is, you know, how great he is. And it's like, y'all ain't telling me anything. But I did have a guy one time that told me Justin was a liar. That did not work out well, did it, Indy? But Justin never said anything about it. He just took it. Well, his dad didn't take it well. To the point that the guy was fixing to call the law. Well, he would, he could have. But that's... Justin, the long suffering and, and just, he's humble. He, one of my pet peeves is people on their phones all the time in the shop. Unfortunately, he's listening to sermons. So what are you gonna say? <laughs> I mean, he's not playing video games or listening to music like everybody else does. It's like, and hey, Dad, look at this. You won't believe what this guy just said. And it's like, man. Well, he showed up about four or five weeks ago and he said, um, let me talk to you about something. I go, okay. Um, Jive talked to me the other day, yesterday, and said something about, uh, he, what do you think about being ordained as a pastor? It's like, oh, crap. <laughs> I don't know, boss, what you think. <laughs> well, I got to pray about it, but I, I, I might do it. You have no idea. what it feels like to hear that. Boss, I love you. Thank you. Uh, pastor's wives, come up real quick, will you? Pastor's wives. We're not going to leave, huh? Or, uh, sorry, Ron. You, you got to call better ball games. <laughs> I think this is uh, we all <clears throat> I thought every person always looked for truth and <clears throat> the truth was in the Bible here on church not about uh, political things 
funds, anything like that, but the Bible and family and church. <clears throat> Watching this and growing up, um, the only thing I have to say is the Lord works in mysterious ways, <laughs> <laughs> and that's the truth. That's the truth. I, I just wanted to say, and I always cry, so I won't even say very much. <laughs> but the, I'm glad that God let me live to see this day. It's been my cry of my heart since I had my first child and, and that my children would walk in God's, in God's love and peace. They would serve him. And I'm so thrilled. And I praise God. He gave me the verse that all my children were raised by, the God, by God because I knew that I couldn't do it. And God has just blessed and worked in the lives of my children. And I can't All right, we're going to close out this way. Right, come on up. Where's your wife at? Oh, I didn't see her. Come on over. We're going to close out with the pastor's wife praying for the new pastor's wife. The little sisterhood or whatever. So you all go ahead and lay hands on her and pray. All right, thank you for being here. Give Justin a round of applause. He's your new pastor, his wife. You can come talk to him afterwards if you want to. They'll be up here. God, as we leave today, we just want to say thank you for having a special service today, being able to set someone apart. Lord, we look forward to where uh, you take us as a church, where you take Justin and Alex as a, as a family unit. God, I pray for the individuals here today, Lord, as they go out into the work week, that you'll keep them safe. Lord, that we will be able to draw closer to you this week. Lord, uh, until we get back here next Sunday, Lord. We just want to say thank you in advance for all that you do for us. And it's in your great name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for being here today. Next week it'll be, we'll get back to normal. <laughs> <laughs>